Um, and Sue Ferguson is from Wilfrid Laurier speaking on social reproduction theory. So first of all, I want to thank uh, the Greater Toronto Workers' Assembly Education Committee for setting this up and inviting me and to Paul and, and Abby in particular for, um, for uh, pulling this all together. Uh, my talk is about social reproduction feminism, which does have a bit of a link to Engels in that, in that it's an attempt to move beyond certain formulations in Engels' um, uh, origins book. Uh, but I'm not going to talk very much about Engels and himself. And uh, so forgive me for having a bit of a, a personal introduction to this. I just, in thinking through how I was going to talk about this tonight, I, I um, just found it easier to think through my own life history or whatever. And, and questions of what frames, not my whole life, but what, but what frames my thinking around this big question of the relationship between socialism and feminism. And so, uh, I politicized in the mid-80s, uh, which was not a, a, a very auspicious time to politicize, but uh, at the same time that I was going to grad school, I went to York University uh, in the political science. And it was an, an inauspicious time um, not only to politicize generally, but it was inauspicious for Marxist feminism in particular. Um, but at York, there were there's a very serious contingent of uh, of feminist, Marxist feminist, socialist feminist, political economist, and who um, were introducing me to all this sort of interesting um, work on social reproduction theory, with social reproduction feminism, and to the work of, as, as well, to the uh, work of Lise Vogel, who um, I'll talk uh, mostly about in this talk. Her uh, book, Marxism and the Oppression of Women, Toward a Unitary Theory, came out in 1983. So uh, anyway, it, it and all my experiences um, were very quickly challenged, or all my kind of anxious learning that I was doing at that time were um, very quickly challenged um, because uh, Marxist feminism sort of came, had a few last gasps uh, with an article by Heidi Hartman called The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism, which was published in, in 79 and then once again in 81. And, and, so just as I was sort of coming on to all these exciting ideas, there was also kind of the, the nail was being put in the coffin on uh, Marxist feminism. And it was also challenged and had been challenged through the uh, 70s and, and 80s by black feminism uh, and intersectionality who would critique Marxist feminism for not being able to, uh, you know, for just simply looking at the question of gender uh, and not being able to, to understand uh, the racialization aspect. And it was also being critiqued by somebody else who's at York, who's, whose work was uh, also very influential to me, uh, Himani Banerjee, for um, the, the political economy sort of aspect of, of social reproduction feminism was being critiqued as overly structuralist and functionalist, and for not starting from people's experience, women's experience as being always racialized, always classed. Um, so all those things percolated in my mind, and, and um, I tried to work them through um, at a time when nobody, <laughs> I felt, was working on these, on these questions at all. Uh, and, um, you know, and I, in particular, tried to use Humanity's work to, to think through Marxist feminist political economy to try to understand how the dynamics of um, capitalist social reproduction could be understood instead of thinking about it in terms of systems and, and uh, functional ways, but understood in terms of a lived socially mediated experiences um, that would foreground the question of the fact or the fact that we labor to reproduce this world um, and that we are laboring bodies who are both gendered and racialized. Um, so fast forward all that to 2011, there's been a resurgence of, of interest in some of these questions as the left kind of struggles for relevance, I think, um, and, and to renew or to rethink some of, of uh, Marx's texts. And um, I think there's a real will right now for people to try to understand how racialization and gender and uh, all sorts of things kind of all fit together. Uh, and I, and uh, I think that in fact, there's a fair bit that social reproduction feminism can offer to try and to understand that theoretically. Um, so there, Lise Vogel's Marxism and the Oppression of Women has been um, reissued last year through Brill, it'll come out again in Haymarket, and uh, David McNally and I wrote an introduction to that, which actually 
also pushed me to try to think what is the contribution specifically of um, uh, social reproduction theory, especially in the wake of this very long divorce between Marxism and feminism and the various critiques. Um, I'm one who in art and movies and, and books don't really like happy endings, but I sort of hope there's a happy ending for this, for this divorce. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, right, okay. so now, in the little bit of time that's left for me, I'm, I'm hoping that when I'm talking about all this stuff, I, I realize I'm kind of assuming people have maybe a bit of a sense of, of, of what I'm talking about already, and I, I apologize. It's, um, uh, certainly feel free to ask me lots of questions in, in uh, the Q&A time. But I, this is what I want to sort of argue. I want to, I want to say that we can look to social reproduction feminism, and I'm going to speak mostly about Vogel's work, not for the answers to all the kind of practical and political uh, questions that the period throws up, but I think much like we use Marx's capital to try to understand the dynamic and the, um, uh, the logic of a patriarchal capitalism. Why in this... Um, this uh, system of ostensibly equally free labor, women continue to be oppressed. And so I, what I'm really saying is that social reproduction feminism can move us, or, or how it does this is, is that it can move us toward a more expansive understanding of capitalism, not simply as an economic system, but as a social system uh, that involves all aspects of our social life. Um, one in which women's oppression is not simply added on to capitalism externally, if you will, to the external to the labor capital dynamic, but in fact is constitutive of that dynamic itself, is part and parcel of it, and, in, and is part and parcel, therefore, of class. Um, I think it also opens up the possibility of understanding racial oppression in, sim in similar terms, although with distinct contours and dynamics, and I'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of, of this talk. Um, I want to reiterate at this point, though, that you know, black feminism and intersectionality have been insisting on the lived experience, the, 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 multi, um, sort of the multi-layered lived experience of uh, race, class, and gender since uh, Sojourner Truth uh, talked, did her famous anti-woman speech in 1851, but more more recently and more relevant to us since the 1977 uh, Kumbahi uh, River Collective statement where they talked about interlo interlocking oppressions um, and just a quick quote from that is that document where they argued, Barbara Smith was one of the sort of leading people there, uh, who argued that we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual and class oppression. Um, so, but so that idea of these things all being interlocking has been around for a long time. Social reproduction feminism has not been, you know, the first to, to say this by any means. Um, but I do think it gives us a way of theorizing it in a way that is not always well articulated by some, some of the black feminists or even intersectionality feminism in my mind. Um, okay, so the central insight of the theory uh, itself Vogel insists that there is an internal relationship between the workings of capitalism and the fact of women's oppression. The process of capitalist accumulation requires, this is all based on the fact that capitalist accumulation requires human labor power, but it doesn't produce it. Um, there's no mechanism in the direct, that is, there's no mechanism in the direct labor capital relation to ensure labor's daily and generational renewal. It's an externality in the, in the terms of, of sort of modern day economics. Um, historically, we know that capitalists, with the state's help, can and will access labor power in whatever ways they can. Slavery, enclosure, um, but also, or including and, and most notably and most commonly, by accepting or supporting the free gift of labor power that's provided by unpaid household labor. So, this is a completely contradictory um, process. Capitalism doesn't create the household. Um, indeed, it actively undermines it, but its need for the renewal of labor power ensures that it will stop short of destroying it and will actively support it. So it's both undermining it and, create, and, and reaffirming it um, all the time. At the same time, the household's not just functional to, to capital. Uh, working class people fought hard, and still do, to protect kin ties, to control the conditions of their own reproduction. So what looks, the, the, the secret is, I guess, that what looks like an external relationship, that is, our lives outside of the, of the wage-labor relationship, 
is actually, and this is what this Vogel would argue, actually an internal relationship between capital and reproduction. And that, of course, grants the forms of reproduction, the fact that it looks like an external relationship, um, grants the forms of reproductive labor, the institutions that we associate with that, the practices, considerable flexibility. There can be, you can have men reproducing women, or children, I mean, um, and, and labor. You can have um, single family, single parent families. You can have um, various forms of, of day, daycare being delivered by the state or not. Um, but all these forms are going to be stamped by the capitalist impulse to privatize, to externalize that work. Um, that is to, to get to make sure that, it, thank you, it's not um, uh, the responsibility of the direct capital labor relationship. And there'll be pressures to keep down its costs through the wages. And this is particularly evident, of course, in this period of, of um, neoliberal restructuring, uh, where public services get pushed back onto the household. So the significance of Vogel's articulation of social reproduction feminism, just to, to sort of then uh, cap, cap, uh, capture that for you, there were others before Vogel who were theorizing the significance of women's, the women's work, um, of women's work in the household to capitalism's drive for profit, most notably beginning with Margaret Benston's 1969 monthly review article called The Political Economy of Women's Liberation. And there, Benston and others were linking domestic labor to the renewal of labor power as a source of capitalist profit. This and that uh, piece began a decade of, of, of debate known as the domestic labor debate um, over the exact nature of that relationship, which resulted in a few somewhat assertive positions that the Vogel documents in chapters two and nine of her book, um, questioning whether or not labor was productive in the Marxist sense or not vis-a-vis uh, -vis capitalism. Is it part produ producing use or exchange values? Is it a separate system? Um, and But it, the debate never really resolved, um, and it, it sort of imploded on its, on its own kind of assumptions in some ways, and people were either abandoned the political, economic, materialist explanations altogether, or developed a structuralist dual systems approach that there is a household form of, of production and there is a capitalist form of production, and the two are, are distinct, and the household is run by patriarchy and the, house, and the, cap, and the, the other is run by capital. Um, that, what, even though that was um, criticized and, and, um, and laid to rest really by Heidi Hartman's article, it was for a long time kind of the default position of all kinds of, of Marxist feminism, socialist feminists uh, in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, but what happened is people stopped trying to theorize it really, and stopped trying to think through how do I explain that relationship between those two? Because it had been very hard to explain, and there had been many criticisms of it. So, um, just to, so the theoretical significance of Vogel's in, uh, intervention in 1983 doesn't get developed. But I, but just to reiterate what that significance is, her, it was it was in rejecting the move among Marxist feminists to relate women's oppression externally as a household system, relate it to another system called capital. Um, so she to an economic system called capitalism. So um, and instead to see the household as part of the economy class or class relation, without any kind of conceptual confusion that would conflate the two to say that the the household did the same sort of thing <coughs> that the, that the uh, labor capital relationship did. So um, let's see. So. Um, she does, so she, she maintains that there's separate things going on in the household and in the, and in the economy, um, but they are e essential to each other and therefore internally related. For Vogel, the socio-material basis of women's oppression then is located in the relation of the household to capital and not in domestic labor itself, which has, I think, been the, co the conceptual confusion many times. In identifying this relationship, Vogel's not so much identifying the cause of women's oppression in any kind of simple or unidirectional sense, or any trans-historical sense, which became a, a real preoccupation of people to try and find out what's the trans, why, you know, why do men um, oppress women. Rather, she's identifying the condition of possibility on which historically, um, sorry, on which historical, biologically differentiated actors create or recreate um, are on new and ongoing gender and class relations. So she's identifying the mechanism by which one aspect of the social 
that is gender relate, relations, relates to another aspect of the social labor capital relations. And this, and not the search for causes, I would argue, is more consistent with the kind of historical materialist or Marxist um, method. It's a focus on relations, not on things or systems. Um, a search to understand how one particular experience, um, how our particular experiences of or locations in the world are distinct, yet also express, expressive of the capitalist nature of the social totality. So most significantly, I think, in so doing, Vogel also reorients the discussion, moving it away from inquiring into the trans-historical cause of women's oppression, and instead asking what allows women's oppression to persist, and indeed what encourages its reproduction uh, under the ostensibly, this ostensibly equalizing system called capitalism. Okay. It's a more limited question, um, but the answer, the intersection of women's biological historical beings with, with uh, capital's impulse to privatize reproduction of this key thing called labor power, the creation of labor power, um, allows us to see why and how women's oppression is constitutive of capitalism that, or of class power, and how resistance to such oppression is uh, central, not added on to. Um, the undoing of capitalism, the overcoming of, of capitalism. I'm going to skip a little bit more than I plan to, um, because of the time. Um, so, and just go on to talk about then how uh, race may figure into all this. So, on race, Vogel is completely silent, and social reproduction feminism doesn't have a very good track record until more recently. <coughs> And I think that's perhaps because there's nothing parallel to the biological differentiation between men and women when you start talking about, about racism that can account for racialized differ differentiations. And capital uh, does not have identifiable needs for differently racialized bodies. Rather, capital's kind of complicit in constructing, it, well, as it is with gender too, uh, a difference that wouldn't otherwise exist. Um, but just as capital works in and through historically structured patriarchal institutions and practices and ideologies to secure this and the next generation of labor, laborers and thus entrench certain gender relations, it also works through racialized institutions, practices and ideologies to secure this generation of laborers. Um, that is, it works through those practices, institutions, ideologies that draw on and reconstitute structures of differential rights freedoms, and degrees of personhood in racialized ways, providing another sort of socio-material linchpin like I want, or basis for the ongoing racialization of people in a system in which we are all ostensibly free and equal. So the terrain of reproduction here is not households. The terrain is, and I think, primarily, I mean, there could be other terrains as well, but I think primarily the global labor market, which is structured in a whole history of colonialism and imperialism. This isn't new, it's been going on since the beginning of capitalism. Think of the Irish displacement and, uh, and migration, the African slave trade. But it's been accelerated and intensified um, as a means of replenishing capital supply of labor in uh, the neoliberal era. The global working class is now um, estimated to be up to 3.3 billion people, about half of which are unemployed, so uh, reserve army, a billion of which are migrants. Remittances from uh, migrant laborers sent back to their home countries exceeded $530 billion in 2012, tripling in the past decade, according to the World Bank. So it's really intensified. Um, social reproduction of workers thus depends not only on the, histor on the household labor that's close to the point of, of, of production, domestic production, but even and ever more crucially on the structures and systems that facilitate and make possible that whole global uh, market in labor. So primitive accumulation pra practices, pushing people off their land, temporary uh, worker legislation denying full citizenship rights and sometimes reproductive rights in the case of uh, many nannies, for instance, in, in various countries to migrants, the militarized apparatus of regulation and surveillance that manages this labor flow these are all kind of examples of historically structured racialized institutions, practices, and ideologies that organize space, our geography, um, as opposed to organizing biology in, in terms of gender, to accommodate capital's needs. They all work to secure a racialized regime of social reproduction, which in turn secures capital's reproduction. And as with the organization of gender and sexual relations, such legal, political structures of differentiation constitute this key, I argue, socio-material linchpin of racial oppression. It doesn't explain every manifestation of it, just like the 
the gender issue doesn't either, but it can and explain how and why racism persists and how it is internally related to the capitalist um, product drive to accumulate and thus constitutive not only of capitalism but of, but of class, of the class power um, uh, and the class struggle to, from the get-go. So I'm not going to do my long conclusion, I'll do a very quick conclusion. <laughs> um, that um, I want to argue then that if, if we can accept, you know, this, if we can start to think about not just the production, the, to think about class not just in terms of um, the work, the wage labor's relationship to capital, but in fact the, the relationship of all people who labor to reproduce themselves, um, for, and to reproduce themselves who will eventually um, make themselves available to capital for, for exploitation, um, then you start to open up the, the, our notions of what class actually looks like. And, if, and you can see that we, all these people are differently gendered, they're differently racialized, and um, that this is all incredibly important to capital's ability to reproduce itself, to, to accumulation. Therefore, anti-capitalist political stru struggle need not be limited to workplace struggles or necessarily even led by workplace struggles, I would argue, however crucial such struggles are to the ultimate overthrow of capitalism. Campaigns for accessible daycare, student strikes against tuition increases, migrant justice struggles, all have the potential to challenge capital's ability to regulate the terms by which it secures the conditions for its own reproduction. And when successful, all shift the balance of power in favor of the working class's ability to control the conditions of their own reproduction. And all of that, I think, has the merit of, of reminding us that the socialist goal is democratic control, not just over production, but over our reproduction, too. Thank you.